Hey everyone, we're back for another episode of On the Line. It's Tuesday, January 24th, and I'm Corey Mall here with Ashley Titians and Olivia Ekbenay. On today's episode, we're going to get into some action that took place last week, including the Under Armour Texas Tech Invitational, the CYUP Misfits Invitational, LSU High School Classic, and more. Plus, we'll get into some discussion on the best boys jumps athletes of 2023, the best girls distance athletes of 2023. So that that's going to be fun. And then we'll finish the show with some coverage of meets coming up around the U.S. and our National Meet of the Week, which is the Legends of Alachua County meet in Gainesville, Florida. Uh, Ashley and Olivia, it's great to see you all yet again. How are you all doing? Doing Pretty great. Pretty good. Anything How about new, you? Anything new this week? Anything, you know, that you got into last week or something you're looking forward to this week? Oh, that's sleep. a good question. There's yeah. a lot of sleep. Recovering. Well, yeah, you had a big, good. big time at the VA showcase. I'm sure you enjoyed recovering. <laughs> oh, yeah, most definitely. And you had a, you know, a whole marathon. So I remember asking you on Monday if you were recovered, and I think you said you officially were. So I feel like this was a weekend of recovery for a lot of us here. The VA showcase takes at least three weeks to recover. Uh, do you agree? <laughs> All right. So I have two more weeks then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, yeah, I went to Memphis this weekend. It was fun. Uh, explored a city that I'd never been to before, really, at length, at least. Um, and it was fun. Got some coffee, ate some food, and now I'm back. All right. So we're going to move right into our first topic of the day. That is the week that was, part one. We're going to go over the the, gov- the meets that took place that were, you know, t- uh, noteworthy of, of note. CYUP, Misfits. The Rad Invitational in Gainesville, the LSU High School Classic, the U.S. Army Invite, and Commonwealth Games in Louisville. Olivia, let's start with you because you're going with something down south. Yes, I'm going to kick it off in Louisiana for the LSU High School Classic. This featured a lot of athletes that that set a lot of state performances, top of the class, which was super amazing. So the very first thing I want to highlight first is Marquez Stevenson. He won the 60 meters with the six. 85 for a new meet record and that equaled him to be the second fastest boy in Louisiana this season. He also ran a 50.15 in the 400 meters and if you've been to the LSU indoor track it is completely flat so there's no banks here so 50.15 on a flat track. He also did a post-race interview with Miles Split and he said it felt good. I've been working. I sat out for the first couple of meets to get back into shape after football, and I feel healthier than ever. So he put everything together this weekend, looked really solid doing it. And again, we're seeing a lot of these football guys coming off of the football season entering indoor track, so it's good to see him out there. Also, I want to give a highlight to Ryan Langley of Zachary. He ran a Louisiana number one in the 1,600 meters with a 413, and he was already the fastest boy going into the meet in the 32 when he ran a 927 earlier this year. But as I mentioned, there were a lot of people that set new state bests. And looking at the girls, our girl, Macaria Harris of Scottsville, clocked a number one time in the 60 meters with a 756 and also in the hurdles with an 855. There were numerous other athletes like Rachel Faraday, who clocked a 220 in the 800, Lucy Kramer, who clocked a 511 in the, in the 1600 meters, Emma Berg clocked a 1111 in the 32. We also had some great performances in the field. Alana Simon high jumped 55, and Marley Richard jumped 37 feet, seven and a quarter of an inch in the triple jump. So again, these are a few of the girls that just set out really big marks in the state of Louisiana. So that was just the highlight for me. Maybe the year of the distance runner in Louisiana. We're going to talk to Ren Langley later in in the week. But yeah, I agree with there with you there. New state record in the sixteen hundred meter. That was crazy. Um, Ashley, let's go to you on your meet. Yes, let's go to Chicago and talk about the CYUP Misfits Invitational. And guys, this was an impressive meet. I have to say, we saw some all time performances over the weekend here. Began first with a U.S. number two all-time 117.52, 600 meters from none other than Andrew Regne- Regnier, excuse me, of Milwaukee Speed Academy. Um, you know, he earlier in the season set a former U.S. number one mark in the 800, and now he gets an all-time mark in the 600. He's only behind Will Sumner now, who clocked a record of 115.58 at the same meet just a year prior. And then, kind of closing out the action, we saw another all-time performance, U.S. number four all-time in the boys' two-mile from Jackson Heidish of Dowling Catholic, 8.42 for that all-time performance, and he's just three seconds off of King Chez's national record in that event. 
But in the same meet, you still have three guys going under nine minutes or two miles. You have Connor Burns in 8.48, Noah Brecker in 8.57 for a Minnesota two-mile indoor record. So some, some great performances on the distant side. Some other performances worth noting, you had Tatum David. She won both the girls' mile and the two-mile with times of 4.50 and 10.22. That two-mile time is a U.S. number one time currently. Then you had Emmy Scales of Arlington Heights. She won the 60-meter hurdles in 8.51, and then she was the runner-up in the 60-meter dash. And then our guy, Hunter Jones of Benzie Central, he runs 407 for the boys' mile. That's a season best for him so far. Did we want to stick on the two-mile at all? I mean, obviously, three <laughs> seconds away from a national record here with, with uh, Jackson. Olivia, did you have any thoughts on the way this turned out that you wanted to comment on? I know we were all in the – we were all on national high school record watch over the weekend, especially when it came to this race. And, you know, I, I feel like it's very early still in the season to be going after some big marks. And a lot of these athletes are coming off of the cross country courses and trying to incorporate that speed into this race. So I felt like at the end of the day, this was still a great performance and congratulations to Jackson who just did a phenomenal job of just executing such a great race. And I know, I don't know how the athletes are feeling afterwards, but I thought it was a pretty solid Fired. race, even though a national record <laughs> did not go down like they were hoping for, but still nonetheless a great performance. Yeah, it was Connor until it wasn't Connor and Jackson kind of came out of nowhere to win the mm -hmm. overall race. And I, I know Carson was was commentating during the race, and I don't know if you both heard this, but he lost his mind. Yeah, it was it's so funny to listen to. <laughs> You're like uh, he he. It was a high pitched screech, and he lost his mind. But uh, you got to give credit to Jackson, who I think at this point we have to erase the idea that he is not a favorite in any race he enters now. Like amazing in the cross country season, really dominated. Now he like really came out and he's three seconds away from national record. Is it? clear to say that he is a, a uh, you know a blue chipper at this point or he's a guy who comes in the race and and is one of the national the nation's best in any race he enters do you feel like we we're, he's at that point now yeah i feel Absolutely. like honestly he's gone i think you mentioned this last week he had been under the radar for so long and i think he's gone under the radar for too long it's it's enough now he's <laughs> one of the favorites i'd say on the distant side and kind of like what olivia said too especially you know coming off of that transition from cross to indoor can sometimes be, you know, a challenge, you know, getting back into that, you know, kind of track racing groove and to have that in your first meet out of the indoor season, that's, that's pretty impressive. Well, do you have anything else coming up? I, th I think you wanted to also comment on a race out of New York. Yeah, I mean, if we're going to stick on this storyline of all-time performances, I think we have to talk about the U.S. Army Officials Hall of Fame Invitational at the Armory. Guys, we saw Quincy Wilson, the Bulls freshman. He got not one, but two freshman national records over the weekend. He ran 102.63 in the 500, which is also good for the top time among all classes seen this season. And then he ran 34.11 in the 300. He won both events there, two national records. I mean, guys, that's just, that's just so impressive to see here from Wilson. I mean, he's been a star you know, for quite some time, you know, in the, you know, the, the club, you know, ranks and stuff like that. So to see him come, you know, as a freshman and get these records, that's, that's pretty impressive to me. And then just another highlight here, you had Kate Putman, who goes 445 in the mile and 253 in the thousand to do that double there. And then Lincoln High School out of Rhode Island, the teammates Christian Toro and Jillian Leahy, they swept both the boys and the girls weight throws with PRs of 79, one and a quarter inch, and then 51. So those were some pretty impressive points there from the Armory. Yeah, I'm sure we're going to hear from Quincy quite a lot over the next couple of months here out of Bowler School. All right, so you recapped the Invitational in Florida this weekend, Ashley, the, the, the RAD Invitational, um, and we've talked about Gainesville over the past couple of weeks. Florida has officially entered the chat with indoor track and field, and, you know, this weekend I just wanted to say it was totally rad uh, the way these, these athletes performed. <laughs> That was bad. <laughs> that was pretty bad, yeah. Uh, 181 elite performances across our database. Among them, Asam Asenga of Montford Academy. He was one of three guys to run a 200, including Zaire Nuritten and Michael Larry. They went 21.35, 21.67, 21.72. That's really, really good. Miguel Tonhas of Hagerty ran a nation-leading 150.58 in the 800. He went 4.12 in the 1600. Two athletes to pay attention to 
over the next couple of months because they are, you know, kind of off the beaten path a little bit. They are multis athletes, so we don't see them quite enough, but they are supremely talented. Aiden Carter, an Oregon signee, he won the pentathlon at the Rad Invitational 3,773 points. That's number 22 all time. I think we're going to see him uh, up uh, toward toward the spring season, really up in the, in the top ranks there in the multis. And then Sophia Young, uh, 3,332 points, number seven sophomore point total of all time. Both of these athletes are from Brentwood, Tennessee. Brentwood's doing some special things with multis athletes, it seems like. Uh, and then on the other end here, I think Michelle Smith, 55-38, the 400. Deja Hodge, 55-70 in the 400. Montford clearly doing some great things. They're actually going to compete this weekend, too, again, at, in Gainesville. So we will see what happens there. All right, we're going to move on to part two of the week that was, and that is Nicholas Harbour and Jelani Watkins. Uh, these two guys went clearly at it in both the, the, the 60 and the 200, and they put down some epic performance here. Uh, Olivia, let's start with you. Just what are your overall thoughts of these two? My mind was blown this weekend. And we already, you know, I had a chance to see Nicholas Harbour and chat with him at the VA showcase just about a week and a half ago. But to actually see him put together a 60 now, that's a whole different ball game. I saw him run the 300. You know, we were, I was even thinking like, what is this guy capable of? Because a 300 is a longer sprint. So it's not like you're just coming out explosiveness there. But we were able to see that from Nick and also Jelani Watkins as well in that 60 meters. Just looking at the prelim, Nick went 6.66 and then 6.64 6, 6, in the finals for a new personal best. Jelani Watkins went 6.79 in the prelims and then 6.67 6, in the finals. And from this race, we had the fastest time, fastest guys in the, in the 60 first spots number one, number two, and number three. So we had the top three fastest guys in the nation coming together at the Texas Tech Under Armour High School Invitational and completely just did an amazing job there. Now, looking in this 200, this was what was also impressive. I know Nick had a huge goal of just like running fast records here. When 20.76 in the prelim, he did not run the final, but set a new personal best there. And then Jelani Watkins won the 200 with a 20.94. And this is the first time in his high school career that he dipped under 21 seconds. Now, just a side note here, kind of looking in this 200 field, I don't know if you guys remember Kendrick Jones Jr., but this guy dropped an AAU Junior Olympic Games 14-year-old 200-meter national record. It, like, blew up the whole internet when he ran a 21.25 he was second overall as a freshman behind Jelani, and he clocked a 21-18 in the prelims in Lubbock, set a new freshman class record there, and then 21-33 in the final. So I thought just across the board, super great job from these gentlemen, especially in Lubbock. Yeah. Ashley, you want to add to that? Yeah. One thing I really want to point out here is, I mean, guys, Jelani Watkins, he's still only a junior. Like, I mean, that's that's impressive. You you see, he ran 2094. That is U.S. number four all time for the junior class. So incredible mark there. It's the fastest mark by a junior since none other than Nicholas Harbour ran this last year. He went 2079, you know, at this meet in 2022. Um, you know, and that was the second best time ever recorded by a junior. And, you know, the same goes for his 60 meter performance, 667. That's tied for U.S. number five all time for juniors indoors. And, you know, I really think he's, you know, not just emerging as the guy in Texas, but he could be one of the guys nationally in the sprints this indoor season. I, I agree completely. I'm going to start with Jelani Watkins. I'm going to end with Nicholas Harbour. But I, two years ago, Jelani Watkins was a freshman in Texas, and I wasn't quite sold on him. He was really, really fast. But in Texas, we know that you can't believe all the marks that you see. So in the spring season, as a freshman, he ran 10.02 seconds in the 100, which – you know, we saw it. We're like, can't happen. Didn't happen. But, you know, when you look at his season after that, um, you start to sense that maybe there's things that aren't amiss here. Maybe he is legitimate. I mean, that 1002 was FAT, but there was no win reading. It's Texas out in the middle of nowhere. So you can't always believe it. But he went on to finish the season six in the 200 as a freshman in 6A. Then last year, Olivia and I were both at the Texas State Championships. He wins the 6A final in the 200-20.78, .7 and he took over in the second half of the race. He also ran 10.21 when dated at the Texas Relay. So the guy clearly has talent. Now, for him to compete with Nicholas uh, shoulder to shoulder in both of these races, I think, speaks to his overall potential. 
this guy is clearly legitimate, and I think he is someone that could break away in due time. But he is a football guy, so you always have to wonder how much stock is he putting into Texas or how much is he putting into track. Um, even that said, I think he's still going to be really, really good, even if he doesn't put his whole heart and soul into it. Um, now, getting to Nicholas, I mean, just absolute behemoth of a man, like just incredible, 666 in the prelim, 664 in the finals, 20.76. As you both said, they're both top 15 all time in those events. I have a question for both of you now. Nicholas is now US one in three events indoors. Um, we just redid the mile split 50 last week. So it's going to be two weeks till we get to it again. But at this point, did he do enough to sort of cement himself in that number one status? Like, where do you all put him after this weekend? Oh, absolutely. I can go first. Oh, go ahead, Ashley. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, hands down, yes. I think if you're U.S. number one in three events and they're all all-time performances, it's hard to – to me, it's hard to deny that. I mean, he's just – he's been dominant. Yeah, I think just kind of piggy, piggybacking off of what Ashley said, I think going into the rankings last week, right, we just saw Nicholas Harbor run the 300. It was like, I personally was like, I need to see a little bit more than, you know, the 33.90. He did a phenomenal job at the VA Showcase, won that from a slower section, kudos to the man. But when we're looking at the mile split 50 rankings, we're taking it into consideration who they're running against, what times they're putting up, and there's a lot of factors that get into it. After this weekend, I think it's clearly safe to say, like, going into this weekend, of course, we're going to see him in two weeks from now. But just going into this weekend, I think it's clearly safe to say Nicholas Harbor deserves spot number one right now. He clearly has just dominated in the 60 now, doing his thing in the 200, rocking in the 300. It's just like, it's hard to be dominant across all those, to show that versatility. It's hard to yeah. have, you know, that explosive start, but also have that speed endurance as well. So I feel like Nicholas deserves that spot number one going into it. And and that would be precedent setting. I think the only other football player that's been as good over the last 10 years probably is Anthony Schwartz. But mm -hmm. Nicholas was a number one, is a number one football recruit as an athlete. Anthony was like top 50. So number one in football now eventually going to be number one in track. That's precedent setting. That's incredible to, to think. But uh, we'll get to that, I think, and more down, down the line. But we got part three of the week that was, and that's the USATF U-20 Cross Country Championships, which was held Pole Green Park just outside of Richmond, Virginia, this weekend. And um, we had some high schoolers perform really, really well. Ashley, you did the, the recap here, so I will start with you first. Uh, talk us through sort of what you're thinking here. Yes, we saw the return of cross country, guys, in January, which is <laughs> kind of incredible to think about. But in the U20 girls race, you know, this was just so, you know, impressive to me. You had five out of six athletes that made Team USA. They're all high schoolers. So, you know, kind of breaking this down. So, um, you know, in these U20 races, both the girls and the boys, the top six finishers automatically qualified to the World U20 Championships held in Australia in February. So you have Irene Riggs, who wins this U20 race in 1945 for 6K, and she's followed by Ellie Shea, Zario Machia, Abby Nikonicki, Carrie Beloga and UNC freshman Eva Klingbell to, you know, round out that top six going to Australia representing the U.S. And then looking at the U-20 boys side, you had Leo Young of Newberry Park. He bounces back. He grabs the win in the uh, boys 8K, 23-46, and he's followed by five collegians behind him. However, I want to point out that Cole Matizan, he gets seventh overall at this meet in 24-11. And now I did see that he posted on Instagram that he'll be making the trip to Australia representing Team USA. So maybe potentially either, you know, someone ahead of him decline the trip or, alternate, or an alternate. Um, yeah. But, you know, we'll see. You know, that's great for Cole Matizan as well. And then you had Lex Young, who finishes 12th in 24-25. And, you know, <laughs> if we want to talk about speed ratings again here, you know, it's been a while since we've mentioned speed ratings. But I found, you know, some ratings for the girls race here. You have Riggs. She goes 165. Shea, 164. And then for Makia, Nekaniki, and Beloga, they all registered 158 speed ratings. So really solid performances there. One more final note. I think this is, you know, a pretty interesting connection. 
Leo and Lex Young weren't the only Young family members to race at this event, and I'm not even talking about Nico Young in this situation. Their mom, Lynn, she finished <laughs> wow. 33rd in the Women's Masters 6K competition, so that's just a running family there. I didn't know that. I know Lynn. I didn't know she was, you know, that that woman uh, running really well, so <laughs> congrats to her. Olivia, let's stick on the, 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 the girls' young women's race here with the 6K format. Um, what are your thoughts from this high school led group? I there's a lot of a lot of thoughts that come into my mind in regards to this race. Thought number one, I remember we were talking about this earlier in the week and I'm like, dang, these kids have just been running for a long time. Like the fact that these kids have been training, probably most of them, some of them, since the summertime. It is now the end of January and they're still hitting the cross country course. So just imagine all the dedication, the effort that had to go into just planning this season around making this U20 team. The second thought that comes into mind is how crazy is it that five out of the six girls that qualified for U20s were in high school? Like that just, like for me, that paints the vision of, we're looking at the future of track and field and cross country right before our eyes. And the fact that we had Irene Riggs doing such an amazing job this season, just, you know, leading the way and just executing such a fantastic race. Ava Klingbell, who was the former NIWAT runner, currently a UNC Tar Heel, was the sixth individual to make this team. And just even looking at what she did as a freshman, she was 36th at the ACC Championships this cross-country season and finished 108th at the NCAAs. Again, such a young talent representing Team USA on the girls' side. So for me, there's just so many thoughts of just like, kudos to these kids for putting it all together especially so late in the season but also that just speaks volumes on the talent that the girls have now looking into the boys side i was just super impressed with leo just doing an outstanding job punching his ticket to u20s i know ashley just mentioned cole matiz and finishing seven lex was 12. uh tyler surface who's another high schooler finished 21st like there was just so many opportunities so many great chances for these kids to just put out some really great times and really just challenge themselves in the 8k like kudos to them so just amazing thoughts from this weekend when it came to the usa track and field u20 championships and, and that's a great note to sort of start with these are distances that these high schoolers have not run uh competitively right. at 6k for for the girls 8k for the guys i would argue both of them are, are really outside the norm but especially for the boys who mm -hmm. you know are just running a very unfamiliar event that being said, all of these athletes are super elite, so they're putting in the mileage anyway. I think all of them could run these distances if they wanted to. I think to, to look at this this race, you got to look at maybe the, the familiar splits on the girls' side. At 5K, Irene went through the split at 1640. Elliot was at 1642. Maki was 1649. Beloga and Nekaniki were at 1649. Five girls are under 17 minutes for 5K here on this, like, really serious event you know with qualification on the line and then they come back and they close in really spectacular fashion Riggs, you know 303 you can't argue she won team nationals now she wins this huge race she's just had a spectacular year um and i think that last k really speaks to to their i think their, their seasons uh, on the guy side i mean leo had a superhuman last k I mean, you look at his splits, one, 1K through 6K, and he's composed and he's poised and he's pretty much hitting three flat every single split. And he's moving up and down the, the order a little bit. On his 7K split, he moves back a little bit, but then he just hits the gas and goes in another gear and he goes 245 on his last 1K. And he, that won the race. He was the fast. That was the fastest split of anyone in that last K, and he, he won it. I mean, that, that's a winning move from Leo, which redemption motivated obviously he didn't finish the way he wanted at team nationals certainly showed that that was an anomaly for him so all the kudos to him um lex you know did finish 12th but he had had a, a great last k as well he went 254 in the last k you know he just didn't have the position that he wanted to over the first seven to, to put him in that that position cole i i think he might get a chance to run you know, he's seventh here. Maybe somehow he gets into the group somehow as an alternate. I don't know. Something happens. But he, he's going to go to Australia regardless. Um, but I, th I just think overall this cross-country season, they're going to miss out on indoor. These guys and gals, they're going to miss out maybe a little bit of the early spring track season. But 
it's kind of worth it, right? To have this moment. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I mean, Olivia, you've talked about your experiences in, I think, Thailand, right? And, um, and other huge U20 championships. That's stuff you remember, right? Oh, absolutely. You remember those moments. I, I remember being in Singapore um, and Barcelona as well for two USA teams that I made. And I don't remember anything else besides those two meets. So yeah, <laughs> kudos to those guys. I would take that over any time. Like this is an opportunity to represent the States. This is an opportunity to just meet amazing people and experience a different culture. So this is going to be all worth it at the end. Yeah, Leo said in an interview that he had chances to like buy a USA singlet, you know, and he never did because he's like, I got to earn it. Um, you got to earn it. it. Yeah, he earned, he earned it. So good for him and good for the rest of the guys and gals. All right, we're going into uh, an another topic, and this is going to be a fun one. We're going to go hot, hot takes. I mean, but within reason here, uh, we're going to talk about. Over the next couple of weeks, we're, we're going we're gonna to do these segments on the best athletes of 2023. We're going to debate who we feel are the top athletes in the country, like regardless of what they finished the previous week or the, the week that they're going into, who are the best athletes in 2023? We're going to start first with the best boys jump athletes of 2023. Who, are, who is the best boys jump athlete of this year? And it's going to be a fun one. I'm going to start with... Olivia, who's the best boys All jump right. athlete? I want to pick an athlete that's kind of close to y'all in Round Rock, who represents Extreme Forest Track Club. My pick, who's a junior, Xavier Drumgool. And the reason why I picked him as the best jumper of 2023 so far this season, this guy has just been so consistent. If I had to pick a word from the dictionary, this guy has been consistent this season. He's already jumped two triple jumps that are over 49 feet. He opened up the year in December with a 49, two and a half jump. And then this past weekend just excelled at the Texas Tech Under Armour meet and set a new personal best of 49 feet, 11 and three quarters of an inch. He also has some long jump uh, strength in him as well. He opened up in December with a 22 foot nine and three quarters of an inch jump, which also brings him U.S. number 29 in this event. So I feel like the triple jump is just a sweet spot to show that consistency, get over 49 feet twice already this season. I feel like that's really hard to do. So I pick Xavier Drumgool as the best jumper so far of 2023. Ashley, do you have any dueling thoughts here? All right, I will say that absolutely the best boys jumper of 2023 has to be Xavier Wolf of Memphis Central. Guys, Memphis Central, you know, has some great athletes, but Wolf here, like, this guy's already on another level, and I expect even more from him to come as we go even more into 2023. He currently leads the nation in the triple jump this indoor season, the only guy over 50 feet in the event. He's also gone 24, 5 and a quarter for U.S. number three in the long jump. Guys, that makes him like the top combined horizontal jumper in the nation by far so far this season. And I think, you know, just looking at his history, too, you know, he has experience training for the multis during the outdoor. And I think that kind of speaks to, you know, some of that athleticism that he has, you know, as an athlete, as someone that can continue to progress. And then, you know, even again, looking at some of his history, he's a guy that he, you know, throughout the course of a season, he progresses extremely well over, you know, the entirety of a season during 2022 outdoors. You know, he both. He hit both his PRs in the long and triple jump in the final meet of the season at the USATF Junior Olympics. So I think if, I mean, if you look at this now, okay, he's already at, you know, over 50 feet in the triple jump, you know, 24-5 in the long jump. If that, if he stays true to, you know, past trends for his progression, I mean, he could hit even better PRs by the end of the season and by the end of, you know, the 2023, you know, competitive season as well. So Xavier Wolf, best jumper. So Olivia went with consistency and potential with Xavier Ashley, you went with Xavier, who's got the best combined marks of the country. I like both the arguments. But the most singularly dominant athlete in the jumps this year is Michael Larry uh, of Montverde Academy. I think it's blasphemy to say anyone else than Michael Larry at this point. Uh, currently, number one in the long jump, 25, 1.25. Outdoors last year, he, he nearly hit 26 feet when he went 25, 11 and a half. And it's not like these jumps or outliers for, for, you know, his, his overall performances, his secondary jumps are just as good outdoors last year, 24, nine, and then 23, 10 and a half. And, and indoors this year, he went 24, two and a half, 
24, two and a half. So every single time out, he's hitting these exceptional marks. And with Micah, it's not just about consistency, but it's potential. I could absolutely see him hitting 26 feet in the long jump at some point over his, his, his year. 26 feet in the long jump by the outdoor season is where I think Micah Larry lies. And that itself would be spectacular. Best in the country. Now, Xavier's got the benefit of two jumps. Mike is more of a sprinter. We can argue about what's, you know, sprints versus jumps, whatever. But I think Micah at this point is the most valuable jumper and the best jumper of 2023. And then there's a side argument too with Jace Posey, who went 7 4 and a quarter in the high jump last year. But He's a hooper. He's not really going to get into track all that much. And he's the son of James Posey. So that makes sense. Um, but Michael Larry, for me, compared to Xavier and Xavier, and I think all the all the arguments here are good ones. I, I appreciate both of them. So um, we'll look out for all three of these athletes as they move forward in the spring season. All right, we're going to go to our next topic, which is the best girls distance runner of 2023. And a little a qualifier here is that both of these girls – are among the best in the country regardless of if they're one or two so you know no knock on either one of them if we pick one over the other but we're gonna have to pick so let's go with ashley first who's your best girls distance runner of 2023 all right guys to me it's no question no question at all that irene riggs is the best girls distance runner in 2023 and to me, it's not just a question of if she's the best distance runner in 2023, but just how good and how dominant she's going to be this year. You know, her resume up to this point just already speaks so much for itself. I mean, you look, you know, just looking at the fall cross country season alone, U.S. number two all time 5K, 1602, team nationals champion. You know, we just mentioned she won the U20 championship in 1945 for 6K. I mean, she's already off to such a great start. You know, she's the top girl on the Team USA headed to World U20 Cross. And, you know, I think if you, you know, if you take her success from the fall, if that translates over to the, you know, the track in 2023, then there's just not, there's not going to be any stopping rigs, you know, indoor and outdoor. And, you know, if you look at her outdoor track times from last year as well, I mean, in 2022, she was the U.S. number two all time in the two mile, 950. And then she ran 437 in the 1600. And, you know, I, I feel like it's kind of this question or not even really question, but like no one has beaten her yet in fall 2022, you know, and in 2023, you know, if you look at world or USATF U20 cross and I feel like, you know, she hasn't been beaten yet. So that doesn't give me a reason to doubt that she'll, you know, be the best distance runner in 2023. All right. That's fair. Olivia, I think you're going another fair. route, right? I'm going another route. Someone's still up on the coast here, but I'm going with Carrie Beloga of Cornwall. And I had a chance to just like really dive into her stats. And I know we're talking about just single handedly the season, but like she has 83 major wins underneath her belt. I'm just going to throw that out there. But I think another thing about Carrie Beloga that I talked about on the boys jump side is this girl has consistency. This girl, I feel like we can argue about this all day, all night, but New York is a difficult state to compete in, especially looking at the distance sides. You have Angelina Napoleon in there, Zariel Machia, Angelina, uh, Emily Bush, and there are other strong competitors in the state of New York. And just consistently, Carrie has just been doing such an amazing job of just facing the competition like a boss. She's qualified for Foot Locker. She's qualified for East Bay and Champs at this point. Each time she's raced to compete and make this this nationals she's done it she's finished in the top 11 each time she's grabbed a victory this last fall with a 1649 and set a new personal best on a very difficult course ashley you remember running at balboa park and you're like this course is tough the fact that they have to run it twice and that is exactly what carrie beloga has done and just talking about improvement she ran a 1729 last year this year's 1649 which is absolutely incre absolutely crazy on top of that again qualifying for World U20s next month, she finished fourth at trials with a 2007, which is absolutely amazing. And to just add the cherry on top, she's also a steeplechaser. So not only can she run really fast for long distances, she can also hurdle over obstacles and get in the water. So kudos to Carrie Beloga. I feel like she's the best distance runner of 2023. All right, we're split right now. So I think I'm like the the, the 
the, the deciding vote here. And Ashley, yes, all you I gotta are. say is Carrie three sixteen because Carrie said so. How about that? <laughs> Gary said so. <laughs> that is that uh, is a good one. <laughs> uh, very fair argument here between both. I think it's really equal. If you go with the recency factor, Irene has been undefeated uh, and she's been dominant. But there's also institutional success, which Carrie has since she was really eighth, ninth, tenth grade. She has been on top of it for a long, long time. Irene's kind of been a little bit more recent to that to that order. Um, what separates them? They both have national titles, so that's kind of equal. Irene has faster times, but as the the OGs would say, cross country isn't about time; it's about performance. So, you know, I think when you look at the times, obviously Irene has carry on that. But for me, when I look at it, I think it's the versatility factor. You know, if I'm if I'm looking at Irene, I, I'm thinking of her as a pure distance runner. 3,200 meters, 5K, 10K, you know, even though she ran that 437 and 1,600 meters last year, which is very, very good, um, that's a good point. But I think if I were to put those two together on a track and I have them running the mile or the 3K, I think I'm picking Kerry because I think Kerry has that that mindset and that, that I'm going to win at all costs kind of mentality. And uh, for me, I need the dog and somebody for to, to describe them as the best uh, ever and, and the best in a year. I think Carrie's got that dog in her. So, you know, if, if push comes to shove and it's coming down to the final 400 meters, who are you going to pick, Irene or Carrie? I'm picking Carrie. Uh, I just think it's an instinct here. And I think they're both equal, equal terms, but instinct's going to carry me on the, on this argument here. So that's what we're going with. Uh, Irene and Carrie is going to be fun to watch over the, the 2023 season. We'll see how it goes. All right, next up, which athlete is most poised to break out this weekend and why? Olivia, I'll start with you first. Yes, I want to talk about Keegan, Keegan Smith. We've been highlighting him. I just remember watching him compete last year as a freshman, now as a sophomore from Knoxville Catholic. He will be competing this weekend in at the Mondo Meet. He is your defending New Balance National Indoor Champion in the mile with a 414, which he set a new personal best. He also clocked a 431 earlier this month at the KYA High School Indoor Classic and has run a 204 in the 800. Now, with that being said, I know – Keegan is very capable of just continuing having success. We've seen him write, rewrite the record books as a freshman, setting all-time best there. So I feel like going into this weekend, I feel like he's going to put everything together and just have an exceptional meet. He's coming off also a very strong cross-country season. He set a new 5K personal best of 14.53. He was also fourth at his state championships as well. So I feel like Keegan is just on the cuff of – Cup right there of just really excelling and pushing the limits for this indoor season. All right, Ashley, we'll go to you. Who's your athlete? All right, I know everyone in North Carolina is really excited to see this guy return to competition, and that's Jacob Laney of Porter Ridge in North Carolina. He's one of the top distance guys in the state, and before you know, running his first indoor meet last weekend, we hadn't seen him compete in any sort of competition since early September during cross country. So last week he made his return to the track at the Sand Hills Athletic and Southern Carolina Conference Championships, and he won both the 1600 and 416 and the 1000 and 234. That's a pretty impressive double there. He slated for the mile this weekend to compete with Keegan Smith at the Mondo Elite Invitational at JDL Fast Track in North Carolina. Um, you know, looking to last indoor season, he ran 4.07 for the full mile, and he's the reigning North Carolina Class 4A 1,600 and 3,200 state champ. And, you know, I feel like this could be a huge, huge breakthrough. You know, he kind of probably already got all those nerves out of the way last week, you know, with, you know, having his first meet in, like, four months under his belt. And so I think that should give him, you know, a boost of confidence going into the Mondo Invitational. And I think he could bounce back, especially this weekend, and be one of the best distance runners in the state. Good action going into the Mondo Elite this weekend. I'm going to move it over to Virginia, where the Bulldog in Vite in Lynchburg, Virginia, is going to have over 2,500 athletes. And the athlete in particular who I think is going to have a very breakout moment is Eli Sterling of Blacksburg High School. Currently ranked number 20 in the 500 with a time of 105.98. He's going at it again. It's going to be his fifth time running the event since 2020. And when we look back at his resume, Really, every time he's run the 500, he's gotten better at it. So I think he's got a lot of potential. He's got 
you know, the speed development in the 300, he's run 36.65 this year, and he's also running the 300 this weekend. And then he has, you know, the endurance too. He's run 229 in the 1K, which is currently U.S. number six. So you combine the speed of the 300 with the 1K, and you, and you land on the 500. I think Eli is set for a breakthrough race here this weekend at Bulldog, and I think he can improve on that 105. Only 12 athletes right now have gone under 105 uh, this season. I think he could be the next one. So uh, good athletes to watch out for this weekend. We're going to move now to coverage around the U.S. W what are the top meets we're looking out for this weekend? Olivia, I will start with you. Yeah, speaking of the Bulldog Invitational and speaking of Blacksburg, I'm going to be talking about uh, a, a teammate, Connor Rutherford, who currently sits at U.S. number one in the 3,200 meters with a 902. He will be running the 1K this weekend, and I just feel like he's just had an exceptional year. He had a really big standout performance at the VA Showcase and just an exceptional job there. I'm going to be highlighting a few of Virginia's top athletes to kind of look out for as they will all be comp competing in Lynchburg. You have Jack Boondy, who's Virginia number one in the 1600 meters with a 414. He's also number four in the 3200, looking to do that double as, and improve on that 916. You have Jeremiah Palucios from Woodside, Virginia number one in the long jump with a 23 foot jump, three and a quarter of an inch. This guy's about to have a very busy weekend. He's entered in the long jump, the triple, the 55, the 55 hurdles, and the 300. So Jeremiah is going to be all over the track and all over the field. So make sure you look out for him. Cassidy Scott clocked a Virginia number one in the 1K at the VA Showcase with a 255. She will also contest that same event in the 1600 meters. And she's clocked a 509 to be Virginia number 12 so far this season. Then, of course, from Freehold Township, we have Emma Zawatsky, the Gatorade Athlete of the Year for Cross Country for the State of New Jersey, will debut her indoor season this weekend. She's entered in the 1K and also the 1600 meters. And last but not least, from Christianburg High School, we have Madeline Moles, Virginia number one in the pole vault, looking to improve on that 12-foot jump that she currently has to her resume. So a lot of great athletes from Virginia and surrounding states as well will be competing at the Bulldog Invitational this weekend. Ashley, let's move to you. All right, we already mentioned this meet a little bit earlier, but the Mondo Elite High School Invitational will be going down at JDL Fast Track in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And Keegan Smith and Jacob Laney won't be the only, you know, top athletes competing at this event. Uh, I want to start off first looking at, you know, I know I talk about them a lot, but they're just so elite. The Cuthbertson squad of <laughs> Celis Kerms, Alyssa Prisano, Justine Prisano, and Charlotte Bell, they'll compete in, in the one mile there at Mondo Elites. And then you also have Allie Zeeland in that mile race there. She's a top girl in Virginia. And then looking at some of the other races to watch, you'll have a Kayla Garrett in the 60 meter hurdles. You'll have U.S. number three, 55 meter racer. Antoine Hughes Jr. of Parkland IB. He'll be competing in both the 60 meters and the 200. U.S. number seven, 500 meter runner Jordan Good of Western Guilford. He'll be in the 400 along with Cuthbertson's Killian Fahey. And, you know, that it's just going to be a really, you know, exciting race there at Mondo Elite. That's one of the biggest races that I believe they have at JDL, and, you know, in the indoor season. So I'll be excited to see what goes down there this weekend. Is Cuthbertson preparing for a four by mile national record attempt? Are they? Oh, yeah, for sure. It's going to happen. They Trust have me. to be, right? Trust me. Oh, yeah. Oh, do you have the inside scoop? <laughs> Not really. I just believe it, you know, heart, <laughs> in my heart of heart. <laughs> it's going to happen. Maybe I just, maybe because I want to see it happen. But I mean, they're, they're definitely. Um, it's the time. Yeah. They're lined they're, up they're, for it. They're lined for sure. up for it. Mm -hmm. They're getting the work in. All right. Uh, other meets to, to, to watch out for. Dr. Sander Invitational in New York City. We have two very fine athletes, uh, both scheduled to run. Um, Shanti Jackson, as Olivia knows, is going in 300. Olivia, is she going after national record again? Is she looking to break what she just ran, do you think, or what? I don't have the inside scoop on that one, but if it were my okay. guess, you know, I, yeah. I feel like Shanti's always lining up to run something fast, so I wouldn't be surprised. Sure. She's done it. It's just, hey, how fast, how low can we make that time? Big, bigger stages time now it's about just performing with those around you um different yeah. expectations you know just do what you can but shanti's obviously the centerpiece there in the high school um entry sophia Goryaran, i think we definitely have to watch out for in the 1k she's going after the national record in new york city it currently stands at 231.41 it's owned by juliet whitaker 
Sophia ran 243 last year. We know she's ready to go. She just ran a fantastic 500. She's got a ton of races under her belt. Now, will she break some records? I think this is the start of something potentially for her. Last chance invitational in Alabama. Over 1,800 athletes are entered in the second uh, meet. In the first meet, there's over 800. So overall, there's 2,600 athletes that are going to be in Birmingham uh, this weekend. And, and, and last chance, too, uh, in the mile, Charles Perry is going up against Tommy Latham of Georgia. That's going to be a really good matchup, a 409 miler versus a 413 miler. And then, really, I, I do want to mention here how good of a season Katie McPhail is having from Chelsea High School in Alabama. She is absolutely rolling this year, absolutely killing it. She has picked up two indoor state records in Alabama in the 800. She ran, she's run 208, and then she's run 444 in the 1600 meters. That was her other state record. Um, clearly the best she's ever run. And then in the, in the 3200 meters, she's gone 1121. She's gonna be racing in all three of those distances this weekend at last chance. And, you know, I think we have to watch out for her because she's just on another level this year. So um, that's uh, one of the meets to watch out for. And, you know, on Mile Split, we'll have all the coverage across our state networks. Uh, so stay tuned for some of our, our coverage on, on national as we as we round those up. All right. National meet of the week is going to be the legend of Alachua County in Gainesville. Let's talk about top entries here. Olivia, I'll go to you first on the boys side. What, who are some of the top entries here? We have some selected entries, but here is what we know. Mount Bird Academy will be showing out once again. They competed, as Corey said, at the Rad Sunshine Showcase, and it was completely rad in Gainesville. And then <laughs> the week before that, they were at the VA. I had to. I'm sorry. They were yeah. at the VA Showcase. Both meets, they have shown that they are a team to beat with exceptional performances. Now, I had a chance to kind of dig into some of the interviews that Mount Vernon Academy had over this past weekend, and most of them were saying, like, this is kind of a practice meet. We're working through some things. So let's see what this weekend looks for them. First and foremost, I'm excited about Zaire Nuridin. He's in the 60 meters, and also he's going to be debuting in the 400. So far this season, he ran a 21.67 in the 200, 33.92 in the 300, and 102.92 in the 5. Now we're just going to put it all together. We got some speed in the 200, got the strength from the 5. Now let's see what he can do in this quarter. Last year at this time, he opened up with a 49.74, and I think we all can agree. I think he is – he can definitely get underneath that mark. And then he ended the year with a 46.04 to win the Adidas Track Nationals, which equals the number three all-time performance. So, Zaire Nuridin, I'm excited to see what you do in that quarter. It's going to be an exciting race to watch. But it's not just going to be him. His teammates, Javion Green, is going to be in the 60 meters and also the 400 as well. He's U.S. number 33 with a 49.15. And then Isam Asinga, who's number four in the 60 – with a 6.73, he'll be in that 60 meters as well, and also in that 400 meters, where he's currently number 30 with a 49.10. He's currently the fastest guy in the state of Florida in the 55.60 in the 200 meters. So this guy has definitely been rolling. But outside of Mount Verde Academy, we also have IMG Academy, which will be there. You have Kane Stanley, who's going to be doubling in the 200-400. He opened up with a 22.15 and a 49.39 last weekend with new personal bets. Then you have Jare Hawkins, who's going to be in the 60 and the 200. And you also have Aiden Henley, who finished second at last year's NSAF Outdoor Nationals in the 400. And he will contest in the 200 and the 400 meters as well. Now, looking also in, into that 200 meters, we have Valentina Rodoff from Lake Manola in Florida. He's entered in the 200 meter with the fastest seed time of 2170, which he ran at the Jimmy Carnance Invitational for a new personal best. So this 200 meters... Don't sleep on it. I think it could be a fast one, but the boys look so far with the entries that, that I've received, it's going to be a fast meet for sure with a lot of great performers. Ashley, move us to the girls. Well, looking at the girls' top, you know, entries, you know, you can't go through the top seeds without mentioning Monbird. So you got a David Hodge in the 60 and the 400, and she currently has the U.S. number two and U.S. number 15 marks in the, those two events. And then you have Makaya Holland. She'll also be in the 60. And then in the 200, she's the top performer currently in the nation in the 60. 
in U.S. number three in the 200. And then their teammate, Olivia Williams, will be doing the 200-400 double. So that will make for, for some exciting action from the Montverde girls this weekend. You know, looking outside of those girls, you have Chelsea Williams of Lakeland Incredibles. She's the top seed in both the long jump and the 60-meter hurdles. And, you know, she's currently one of the top performers in the 55-meter hurdles this season. And she's, you know, a top 20 performer in both the long jump and the triple jump. So a very versatile athlete there. And lastly, looking more on the distance side, you have Kate Drummond. She's a University of Florida signee. And she could potentially go sub five, sub five excuse me, this weekend in the indoor mile. And she's making a uh, season debut this weekend. So exciting stuff on the girls' side. I think we're all sort of curious to see how this this meet's going to play out. Let's go to the potentially top race to watch out for here. And a lot of good ones, but I think we're going to center in on the girls' 60-meter race, which will feature Montford's Micaiah Holland and Adesha Hodge. Team Blue's Sophie Hogg and Anaya Kent. Both of those girls are from Florida. Nid is actually from Alabama. And then we have Parrish's Morgan Gingras. Um, she leads five more girls that are seated eight seconds. Um, so it's going to be a, a wonderful uh, display of sprint talent there. Olivia, of, of this field, how do you think it will shake out? How do you think it needs to be raised? To answer your questions, Corey, it's going to be a fast one for sure. You, you, we can't overlook Micaiah Holland and Adeja Hodge, 721 and 724, currently U.S. number one and U.S. number two. Holland actually ties for number four all time with that performance that she ran at the VA Showcase. And I feel like it's going to be tough to take Holland down. She's been on a whole new level this whole entire season. She's sharp. She's posted up some of the fastest times to set the tone already. Next thing is just executing now at that bigger stage and putting everything together. So I feel like this is a great race where she can just put everything together and kind of work on those fine tuning things that she's been working on. I guess my biggest question is, as we were kind of talking about here, there are five girls that are under sub eight in the 60. I feel like we can have more than five. And I feel like when you have athletes like Adeja Hodge and Micaiah Holland in this field, you're going to be running fast, right? The goal is just mm -hmm. to try to be as close as you can to these ladies. And just to throw this out there, the Florida State record is a 719, and Shanti Jackson broke the national high school record with a 718 last year at the Milrose Games. With Holland and Hodge in the same field together, I feel like we're going to see something really, really special. And potentially we could see a lot of things go down this weekend. So for this race to execute the way it's supposed to be, Holland and Hodge are just going to be up there in the front, sprinting their hearts out, great starts, being explosive all the way through the finish. And I feel like the rest of the field could feed off of that and push to new personal bets as well. Would you go as far as to say the national record could go down in this race? I feel like it could. Absolutely. Especially with Holland and how sharp she is looking right now. She's been running really well in that 200. She has that strength. It's now just like I've mentioned, there are all, most of all the interviews were saying, we're working on fine-tuning some things, and this is kind of their practice meet. So they're probably putting a lot of things together. And again, that bigger picture is nationals coming up in March. That's where the big things happen. But hey, along the way, the national record goes down, a national record goes down, and you guys already know I am all for it. So I think it's definitely worth mentioning and having that conversation that a national record could go down this weekend. Ashley, how do you, similar feelings from that vantage point, where do you feel like this 60 could go? Oh, yeah. You know, I think, you know, I agree with Olivia on all those points there. You know, I think we need to be on national record watch. Maybe this could be another hot take, but potentially could Holland and Hodge both surpass the, the current national record? That could be a that would be interesting to see. I mean, they're they're teammates and they both ran, you know, 721 and 724. I think that is very possible. Again, could be, you know, a stretch, a hot take, but I wouldn't be surprised if it happened. And, you know, kind of like what Olivia mentioned, too, I think, you know, the fact that we have five girls under eight seconds in this field and so many others on the cusp, I think that just shows, like, just how much speed there is in Florida already this indoor season and how deep the state is. And, you know, that's not even looking at, you know, just Holland and Hodge. Like, we're looking at all of Florida here in this field. And, you know, some other athletes I want to mention that I think could have some breakthrough races. I'm curious to see what Sophie Hag does. She's coming off a 60-meter win at the Rad Sunshine Showcase this past weekend. Also think someone like EOTO Elite's Arbrielle Scott, you know, who's a top long hurdler in Florida, could, you know, have a big race in the 60 to test her speed. And so, all in all, I think we're, I'm really excited to see what happens, you know, national record or not, or, you know, PRs or not. I think it'll be pretty impressive to see all these Florida towns, you know, go head to head. Yeah, I, I think the field helps 
you know, boost the overall atmosphere of it up a, a, a tenth degree, really, because when you have that much speed on the line, potentially once they reach the final, I think it helps you. And I, I agree, Olivia, I think we could see a lot of girls under eight seconds. If that's the case, then you got to look toward the front. The faster it is, the faster the, the, the winner is going to be. And when I, I look at Holland, I mean, she hasn't really run it that often, but every time she gets in a, in a big, at, at a big event, uh, um, you know, a challenging final and there's a lot of stakes on the line, she actually runs really, really well. Last year at Adidas Track mm -hmm. National, she ran 734 to take the win in the 60. This year, she's really only run the 55 or the 60 twice, the prelims and finals of the VA Showcase, and she's got that 721. Mm -hmm. If you consider the fact that she's getting coached by Gerald uh, Fury, who is a, a sprint guy at heart, um, an A&M graduate mm -hmm. like yourself. Um, I Gagan. think, yeah, I, I think she can put those pieces together pretty clearly. And I actually love that, that mention of can two break the national record because I think things often work in pairs. Um, I could, yeah. I could, I could see that happen, you know, two going uh, under that mark because, you know, these athletes are training with each other every day. I think they all want to reach the same goals. And, you know, that's that to me would define success. Not just one person getting to that line, but the second one too. Um, so I, I think clearly that there's a lot of potential here in the 60 and, you know, we could see some something special go down. But you're going to have to watch out for it because it will be live on Miles Split, streamed by FL Runners. Uh, our guy, Brandon Miles, who is doing all the, all the things there in Gainesville, he's going to have full streaming coverage, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll supplement it here on Miles Split National, too. Um, you know, it, it's been a fun season so far. If you gals were both to define sort of what's happened so far in the indoor track season, I mean, is it just above expectations right now? Like, how do you feel about the indoor season just as we close off here? Olivia, sorry, I'll go with Olivia first. No, it's fine. I was like, I'll let Ashley go. I yeah. feel like it's above my expectations. And the reason I say that is because I feel like, I, I almost feel like it's still pretty early. But again, it's crazy to think that like next in the week, you know, in about 10 days, it's going to be February. So before we know, it's yeah. going to be nationals. But the fact that we're seeing so many great performances just across the board for both the boys and the girls side right now, it just makes me so excited to see like, what's going to happen as the season unfolds into March and also going into the outdoor season as well. I feel like this whole entire season has exceeded my expectations. Athletes are putting out really great performances, all time best. We've already seen two national records go down based off what we're talking about this week for this weekend. We could potentially see two more go down. So it's, it's just an exciting year so far. Ashley, how about for you? What are your thoughts? You know, like, I think the word that comes to mind for me is honestly just historic like i mean we're only in january and we've already seen so many all-time performances i mean that's just really impressive to me and to think too that you know we still haven't seen every athlete debut indoors yet there's still some you know guys and girls out there that haven't made their season openers and you know i feel like there's still the potential for so many more things to happen down the line like you said we're only still in january still got february and nationals you know ways away in march too as well so i feel like to you know the fact that historic comes to mind is the first word to describe the season so far, I think is a testament to just how impressive it's already been. One last question before we end. What will happen first this year? A sub 23 second 200 in the girls distance or a sub 46 in the boys 400 on the boys side? What happens first? Sub 23. Ah, I like that. I, I agree. Really? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. 100%. Madison, you White's already Madison White, already. Yeah. He's already at twenty-three too. So, hmm, <laughs> that's thinking. a tough one. I'm really here. I'm really thinking. I'm really thinking because yes, Madison White twenty-three twenty-two is ridiculous. But I'm also thinking like I'm just thinking about Zaire right now. Like we have not seen the top returner open up, so I really don't know. This guy could come out with, who knows? I don't know. But like. I don't know. I'm going 46. I'm going to be the. You know what? It would be. It would 46. be. It would be magical if Harbor just runs a 400 and somehow Harbor breaks. <laughs> that would be. Now that, would, that would be the storyline. That, 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 that would. That would cap Pick things Nick, off. I think. Yeah. For you sure. could just end the indoor season right there. Absolutely. <laughs>
<laughs> all right. Well, we will be back next Tuesday for another episode of On the Line. Thank you for listening. We'll have all coverage of, of indoor track and field meets on milesbud.com. So stay tuned for that. See you later.